Who's the smartest guy in the room? Uh, I'm going to think, uh, Bob, do you have your master's? You do, don't you? My, he's got a specialist degree. Dr. Uh, Dr. Payne was in the early service. He has a doctorate. Anybody have a doctorate in the room? Oh, I forgot. Dr. Sean. Sorry, Bob, it's not you. It's, it, it's, it's Sean, okay? So, Sean, you're on the spot. I want you to explain this. No. <laughs> Intercal intercalation. Who's got chemistry? Emma? You have chemistry, don't you? What's an intercalation? We haven't been taught that. Pastor Mark said I didn't have to wash my hands. <laughs> so I learned what an intercalation was this week, okay? Uh, by the way, I took uh, one semester of chemistry, and the chemistry teacher said, you should probably transfer to history. <laughs> um, an intercalation in chemistry is where you take one element or one compound and you put it inside of something else. It goes in between something else, okay? But there are also intercalations in literature. Now, that's the ones that I was dealing with. Uh, it's kind of like a sandwich. You have the bread on the outside and then... You put something on the inside. It's, a, it's an intentional process, okay? And so that's what's happening today in our passage out of Mark, okay? There are six intercalations, or the kind of the layman's term is Markin, like Mark, John Mark, Markin sandwiches. That's what they're called. There are six of these in here where Mark take, takes a story and somehow he puts another story in the middle. So he starts a story, he goes to a completely different topic, and then he finishes the first story. And it's kind of weird. That is our passage today. And for a long time, this last couple, three weeks, I was thinking, why does Mark do this? It's very evident in this story that we're going to look at today. Now, why didn't he just finish the first one, put that one all together, wrap it, put a bow on it, set it under the tree, and then go for the next one? Okay. But he doesn't. He makes a sandwich out of it. And he does this six times in his gospel. So we're going to see today, and I'm going to read it. I don't have it up on the screen, but we're going to read it. And I just want you to hear the story. And I want you to think about the people that are in the story. Okay? Now, obviously, there's a crowd of people. And obviously, there's Jesus. There are the disciples. But there are two main characters in the two stories. One at the beginning and one in the sandwich. Okay? We're going to, we're going to think about them. As I read the story to you, think about the things that are different about these two people, okay? And then think about the things that are the same, okay? There's a lot of things that are different about them. There are a few things that are the same. I'm reading out of uh, Mark chapter 5 in the New International Version. So if you're following along on your app or on your Bible, and it's a different version, it sounds slightly different. But the, the main parts, you'll get it all. Just think about these two people. One of them is a man named Jairus. J-A-I-R-U-S. -I -I and the other one, we don't even know her name, but it's a woman. Okay? So think about them as Mark writes what happens. Last week, we had the when pigs fly. When Jesus exercised the demons, they went into the pigs on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, okay? So the other side of the Sea of Galilee was a pagan area. It was heathens. There, was no, there were no people there that worshipped the true God. So it was foreign. That's why all those weird things happened. But now he has come back to Capernaum, or Capernaum. That, there's a synagogue there. There's Jewish settlement there. There's, it's a town of several hundred uh, historians and Bible scholars tell us. Five, six, seven hundred people, maybe, Okay? So now they're back across, he and the disciples come back across the Sea of Galilee in a boat, and that's where we pick up the story. Chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded 
earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Here comes the sandwich. Here comes the rest of them. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. And he turned to the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear. She told him everything, the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, back to the first story, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to tell, let anyone know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. Two people that have a connection with Jesus that is not exactly by coincidence. So let's look at those two people. We're going to start with Jairus. Jairus was a leader of the synagogue. He could have been... 30, 40 years old, he had a daughter at home, a little, a 12-year-old girl. Uh, he probably was not a priest. He wasn't a Sadducee or a Pharisee. He wasn't a scribe. But there was a kind of a lay leader that was in charge of everything else. So he wasn't in charge of the worship, the sacrificial lamb, the scrolls of the Old Testament. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't that guy. But he was probably in charge of everything else. He was in charge of the building. He was in charge of the... The, uh, if they had synagogue um, guards, the police force, everything around the facility, all the people coming and going. He was in charge of supplies. He, he was a man of influence and responsibility. Okay? Um, and he has come to Jesus because he is desperate. The Bible doesn't say that he went to the Pharisees. He didn't go to the scribes. At least we don't know that he did. But he's coming to Jesus. And if you remember, Jesus has already butted head with the, heads with these people. In fact, some of them were planning to kill him already. But this man, because of some story he's heard, or something he's seen, or some eyewitness to a, maybe another miracle, hey, you should go find Jesus. He can help your daughter. He acts on that. And he goes, and he finds him. The other one is the woman. How are they alike? 
and how are they different. Let's talk about for a minute how they're different. Jairus comes in a very visible way. Large crowds, a lot of people. The woman wants to be invisible. She doesn't want anybody to know that she's there. She's all by herself. She doesn't have servants that are with her, people that are coming and going with a message. She wants to remain anonymous. They're completely different in kind of the, the setting or their visibleness or invisibleness. Which way do you lean? Sometimes we're, we're together as a church. We share our hearts, you know. We share our burdens. We share our tears. Sometimes we just want to, don't want anybody to know. Don't talk to me. Don't touch me. Give me space. I just want to be alone with God. They're different in the way they came to him. He was very religious. He probably went to, t- to the synagogue regularly. He had certain duties. He had certain procedures and a rhythm of his religious life. She may not have had any. She may not have ever been to the temple. Maybe she just heard about Jesus on the street. He had a 12-year-old daughter. She had a 12-year-old illness. Jesus reached for Jairus' daughter. The woman reached for Jesus' cloak. The Bible says that Jesus touched the daughter But it also says in this passage that she touched him. There were a select few people that saw the miracle of Jairus' daughter to be raised. Peter, James, John, mom, and a dad. There was a huge crowd that saw, eventually, they put the pieces together, this woman was healed. But also, the man, Jairus, was probably, um, he was in a situation in his life, in his standing, where he was respected. This woman, as evidenced by the way it was recorded, we don't even know her name. She was probably rejected. So why does Why does Mark make a sandwich with these two stories? I think it's intentional. I think it's the purpose of God for us to see that no matter who you are, well-respected, well-connected, responsible life, people that you can tell them do this and they do it, are rejected and alone. No one besides you Invisible. Either way, you need Jesus. Let's look at one verse about Jairus. and We've already gone through it. Verse 22. Then one of the synagogue leaders came because, you remember, this is the second half of the story. Uh, when he came, he saw Jesus. He, oh, no, excuse me. This is the first part. He fell at his He came to Jesus. He fell at his feet, and he pleaded with him. Those are the verbs in this story. That's what he did. He came to Jesus, fell at his feet. Why did he do that? Does the posture of our body make a difference in what it communicates? For example, if you were in a meeting... Let's say you were working on a project to school with people uh, at the high school together. You were at work, and you had a meeting with your colleagues and peers. You were at a meeting at a hospital with some doctors and some techs and nurses. Anyway, you're, you're at a group around a table, and you're at a meeting, and someone who you're trying to interact with leans back in their chair and does this. Does that communicate something? Our, the posture of our body communicates. Our, our bodies, our physical self is connected to our spiritual self. We would like them at times to be totally separate. But just think about it. Stress, 
worry, if, if, if you let it go unchecked, will affect your physical body. You'll get an ulcer. Your heart rate, your stress will cause a, a heart attack. Okay? Our spirits, our persons that live in these bodies are not disconnected and unaffected. They're connected. Okay? And so the posture of our body is also connected to our... It says something about our spirit, our condition, where we are, especially in relationship with other people, but also in relationship with God. So what did it say when this man, who is a Jewish leader, is coming to this rebel Jesus, and he falls at his feet? He came to him, he fell at his feet, and he pleaded with him. It says pleaded earnestly. Have you ever pleaded with God about something or someone? See, he's pleading on behalf of someone else. What does Jesus do? He comes to this man with a certain amount of faith. He doesn't know how. He doesn't exactly know why. He can't explain it. But he believes, according to the Bible, that all Jesus has to do is touch her, and she'll be healed. She has some faith. Are you like Jairus? Or are you more like the woman? Rejected? Invisible? Um, you know, alone? There's a verse that, just, that shows what she did. Now, she has two parts. She has the part where she reaches out and touches his cloak, and nobody knows about that. Okay? But then she also has this verse in 33. After she touches him, and the Bible says that power went out of Jesus. Jesus knew it. Now, I think Jesus knew anyway. Okay? This wasn't a surprise to him. Okay? And, you know, in fact, when he starts asking, who touched me? Who touched my co cloak? I think Jesus knew. You know, it, and he may have been making eye contact. He may have been going, who touched me? looking right at her. I mean, you make eye contact with people. Who touched me? But in the second exchange, not the invisible one, where she touches him, she goes to him and she touches him. And this one, the Bible says, then the woman, knowing had what had happened, came to Jesus, fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. She revealed her deepest, darkest, just like Jairus. This is, this is the inside of me. I am pouring it out. Jesus knew her. There are a couple of reasons I think this unfolded this way, and therefore Mark put it in a sandwich. Now, one of the guys I asked, him, why did Jesus do this? And he, he said, duh, that's the way it happened. That's just the way the day went. That's the... That's why he wrote it that way. Well, yeah, that may be it. But that leans into the sovereignty of God. Okay, for a couple of reasons. Number one, here's one of them. I think Jesus knew who touched him. So why would he make a big deal about who touched me? Two reasons. For this woman, but also for everybody else there. This woman knew she was healed. Jesus could have gone on. She was healed. Jesus could have thought as he was walking, someone touched me, someone has been healed, I see her, and he could have kept right on going. But he didn't. The Bible says he stopped, and he turned around, and he asked, who touched me? He's doing that for that woman. He's solidifying her faith and her miracle. He's calling her out, if you will. How many of you, maybe in a church service, maybe at a concert, maybe with a friend, you've been called out spiritually where you couldn't hide anymore? Some of you, it was the day you were baptized. You know? We've had several, three, I can remember three or four times at Friendship Church where we have had a baptism service and we had five or six people scheduled to be baptized. And we ended up baptizing twice that many people. 
Dallas told the story today about the time in his, that he played the guitar the longest it was a January the 1st Sunday when we had baptism scheduled. What year would that have been? 2017? I could look it up on people. 20, Jensen says 2012. My brother Justin. You know? Um, Larry Dudgeon. We had people scheduled. And it was like Jesus called them out. When I gave that last call for alcohol, you know, we're closing down. Last one. Anybody want in? There were several people. In fact, there were several people that were not planning on being baptized the day they were baptized. There's something about us that when we're called out of the shadows, it solidifies us. If we respond, this woman could have run away. She could have slipped through the crowd. And some of you have done that. When Jesus called you, you made a quick exit. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's God's timing. That's God speaking to you. Okay? There's another thing about this that makes this sandwich really cool. If Jesus, if Mark had written it differently because it would have happened differently, if Jesus had followed Jairus onto the house and the woman had not touched him or he had not acknowledged that, stopped, turned around, called her out, she eventually, may have taken two or three minutes, she acknowledged it, she told the whole story, everybody in the crowd now knows what happened, Jesus has done a miracle. What happens next? Jairus gets word that his daughter's no longer sick. She's now dead. It's a matter of timing. Jesus would not have been able to raise Jairus' daughter if he had got to the house before she died. So it was, it was imperative and it was God's sovereign will that he was delayed by this miracle with this woman so he could raise Jairus' daughter. That happens three times in the New Testament we know of that Jesus raises somebody from the dead. The first one, I think is in the book of Luke. Uh, it is around a town by the name of Nain, N-A-I-N. I think it's in Luke. You can look it up. Jesus is coming toward this town with the, some believers and the disciples. And coming from this town of Nain is a woman, the Bible says, who is a widow whose only son had died. And they're carrying this casket out. She's leaving. Jesus is coming. By the way, the, the, the name Nain means beautiful. Beautiful. She's leaving everything that's beautiful, everything that's good, everything that's life. And where's she heading? With a casket. To the grave. She's headed toward death. She's headed toward darkness. She's headed toward hopelessness. And at just the coincidentally, the right time, Jesus comes and meet her as she exits the gate at the town of Nain, headed for the grave, and Jesus stops her and reaches over and touches her son and raises him. Perfect timing. The second one is this one with J. Iris' daughter. The first story is more obscure than, than any other. We don't know the woman's name, and we don't know the, the son's name. All we know is the town's name. Okay? If you're in Christ, one of these days, you can sit down with her, or you can sit down with him and say, tell me the story when Jesus raised you. This one, we know the dad's name. The third one, we know everybody's name. That's Lazarus. Martha and Mary send word to Jesus. The one you love is sick. That's Lazarus. They're, they're brothers and sisters. So Jesus gets the word. He's with the disciples, and I'm sure they're packing up. They're getting ready to go because they're going to go and see about Lazarus. And Jesus says, no, we're not going. And Thomas says, what? What are you talking about? You love him. Yeah, we're not going. I'm sure they were just, have you ever been confused and perplexed by God's plan? Especially when you're in the middle of it. It's only afterward that we see it. 
So they wait one day, two days, and they, then they get word that Lazarus has died. And Jesus says, now let's go. And they're like, what? Now? Why didn't you go before? Perfect timing. Perfect timing. It's God's will. So that brings us to the last part of this story. Because you're in the story. Once again. Where are you? Have you ever pled with God? Have you ever been at a place in your life where everything else you've discounted and the only thing that's left is Jesus? Have you come to him? Have you fallen at his feet? Then that's symbolic of, you know what? It's not me. It's you. It's not my life. My life is gone. It's buried with Christ, and I want to live a new life with you. Come to him. Fall at his feet. Pour out your life. That might be pleading with him. That might be with trembling and fear, just telling the truth. Have you ever told God the truth? He knows it already. That's not the point. When we talk honestly with God, it's not a matter of informing him of things he doesn't know. He does it for us. He called this woman out for her. She told with trembling and fear the honest truth about her life for her. Which gave her an appreciation of who it was that called her. You will not know intimacy with God with Jesus if you don't respond to his call if you remain anonymous and invisible God is there he might have even done an amazing miracle in your life but you won't know it because you ran away from him calling you don't run away so I want to close with this verse I'm going to read some lyrics to a song and then we're going to sing one more this is what the Bible says. God is calling you out of darkness and death. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. That might be some of you in this room. You've heard this story about Jairus' daughter. You have heard the story about this woman. You might have even have heard God's call or felt God's call in your life. And just like Jesus said to the disciples, but even as I've told you, even as I've called you, even as you've heard the word and the truth, you still do not believe. Or maybe you're like Jairus. Or maybe you're like this woman. That you have this much faith. And Jesus says, if you'll come to him, Fall at his feet. You'll never be hungry and you'll never thirst. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. What's your next step? We're going to close our song today, uh, our service today with one more song. I'm going to be up at the front. If you want to come pray with me, we'll sit down on the front row and we'll pray. If, you, if God's calling you, don't ignore that, okay? Whatever it is. Even if you, come to, if you come to the front at any service, at an altar call, or if I'm giving you an invitation, here's what I'm going to say to you, okay? I will always say this. I, every time I start with this, okay? Why have you come? Because I don't know. There could be all kinds of things, okay? So I will just want you to tell me. And you know what is a good reason? I don't know. That's as valid as anything else. I don't know why I'm here. I just know I'm supposed to be here instead of there. You see, when Jesus called these people, they followed their faith with action. Okay? Now, the song we're going to sing is called Evidence. And it could have been written five years, ten years, twenty years later by J. Iris or by this woman. Re listen to these lyrics. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. 
in every season from where I'm standing. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life. Help me remember when I'm weak. Fear may come, but fear will leave. You lead my heart to victory. You are my strength. You always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. All over my life. I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life. And then it closes with a, with a tag at the end that says, Why should I fear? The evidence is here. Why should I fear? The evidence is here. This morning, let's sing this song like this person who has been redeemed. Let's sing it as an anthem. If God has saved you, if your next step is just praising Him for all the evidence that you now see in your life of His goodness in your life, then great. If God's calling you to take that first step, like that woman, or a desperate step, like Jairus, let's do that together this morning.